Welcome friends, welcome back to the kitchen. Welcome back to Sunday morning and the old cookbook show. Today we're going to do a recipe out of this little cookbook sent in by a viewer. Thank you very much. I love getting these things. Um, this one's called Ma's Cooking. Ozark recipes spiced with old Ozark customs, sayings and superstitions. Um, this isn't that old. Uh, this is published in 1966. So <laughs> it's as old as I am. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a style of cookbook that I've, I've got about a half dozen books like this in my collection. Uh, I consider them to be joke cookbooks. Um, and let me explain. Let me, let me get going on the recipe first. We're gonna do something called Mabel's Molasses Creams. So just like any cookie, starts out with some butter and sugar and we're gonna cream that together. And the sugar, and we'll just get that onto cream. And what I mean by joke cookbooks. Um, so this is published 1966. It's published in the South. It's published in Missouri, Osage Beach, Missouri, um, by a company called Ozark Made Candies. It is a community cookbook. A lot of the recipes in here are submitted by members of the community. They want them published. But it really plays on that down homey um, Mountain William sort of trope. Uh, the language of all of the preambles is is written. You're supposed to read it in a in a really sort of southern, uneducated, back in the holler kind of uh, kind of voice. Um, it's jokey to the point that I, I just, I don't find it funny. But what I do find very interesting are the recipes. Um, some of the recipes are put in here to shock, like all of the ones that, that use possum and raccoon and that sort of thing. Uh, in 1966, I doubt many people were, were cooking that way. Is that a Chinook? I spent far too much time at an airport. That was a Chinook um, going by. So look up Chinook helicopter. That just flew over my house at about 1500 feet. Anyway, so it's written in a voice that reinforces stereotypes. Um, and I, I really don't like that. But like I said, the recipes are solid. And one of the things that books like this do is in a, in a jokey way, they're trying to preserve recipes that are probably being lost. And the books themselves, the ones that I have are, aren't always meant for keeping, like they're not meant to be family heirlooms passed down. I think there's the, the sort of things that you would see if you've ever eaten at a Cracker Barrel at the side of the highway in the US, you know, they, they've got that general store in the front. This is the sort of thing that you would find in that general store. Um, serious cookbook collectors would look at this and say, no, it's not a serious cookbook. I look at it and say, it's not a serious cookbook, but it has some serious worth in preserving a slice of culinary history. Okay, the butter and sugar looks great, so we're gonna crack in this egg. And get that all creamed together. So this is a Southern recipe book from the Ozarks. The recipe is attributed to someone from Missouri, um, and it calls for sorghum molasses. So it's called molasses cookies or molasses creams. But it specifically calls for sorghum molasses. And I happen to have some really good sorghum molasses here. So we're gonna put that in next. Um, this is pure sorghum molasses. Something that is and can be fairly difficult to get. I'm gonna turn this off because it makes a mess. Uh, pure sorghum can be a little bit more difficult to get these days than it would have been um, in the time period of this cookbook, the 60s. And Definitely, even in the 60s, it would have been harder to get than it would have been um, pre-World War II or pre-World War I. So if you can't get sorghum, uh, a light molasses or a lightly flavored uh, cane sugar molasses would be fine. Golden syrup would be fine. A light treacle would be fine. Um, even if what you have is um, corn syrup. Go ahead and use corn syrup. You're gonna miss out on the flavor 
that you're getting from the sorghum, but the sugar content would be roughly the same. Though if you can get sorghum molasses, uh, I highly recommend it. So here I have some flour, and to that I'm gonna add ginger, cinnamon, and salt. And we'll give that a bit of a stir. So there's a couple things about this recipe that tell me that it's a, it's a fairly old recipe passed from generation to generation, and probably the first couple times it was passed down, it was just done verbally. No one wrote it down. And one of the clues is that it calls for five cups of flour, about five cups of flour. Not five cups specifically, but about. And so that, that sort of uh, loosey-goosey measure means that the first person or the people who made this didn't really measure. Everything was done by sight and they just sort of scooped flour in until it was done. It's about five cups. So in this bowl, I've got four cups of flour and that's what I added the spices to. This bowl, I have the fifth cup of flour and I'm gonna hold that aside. If I need it, I'll put it in. If I don't need it, I haven't wasted spices by putting it into that bowl. Um, the next thing is it asks me to put the baking soda into a tablespoon of, of vinegar. And that tells me that it's a, it's a recipe that sort of stems from the dawn of chemical leavening um, in North America. And that at the beginning, baking soda wasn't always good. And so putting it into a little bit of vinegar means that you're testing it to make sure that it's good. It's something that in 2022 we probably don't have to do. Um, and it's not the acid in the vinegar that's needed to, to activate the baking soda because it calls for buttermilk. And the buttermilk itself would have more than enough power to activate that amount of baking soda. So the buttermilk goes in. And at this point, I'm gonna spoon in the flour, get that mixed in. So I've got about half the flour mixed in. At this point, I'm going to mix the soda into the vinegar, foams up immediately and into the cookie batter. And now I'll just spoon in the rest of the flour until I get a dough that is scoopable. So for me, I'm at four cups of flour at this point and I'm really close, I think. Um, I'm gonna say four and a half cups of flour will do it for my dough. The mixer's having trouble getting this last little bit in. So I'm gonna say, Four and a half cups is what I needed. Now, for everyone out there screaming that the recipe calls for shortening and not butter, and that I probably should have used something like Crisco. Maybe. Um, vegetable shortening is one kind of shortening. Lard is a shortening. Um, the word shortening has more to do with what the fat does with the flour and the gluten structure than to an actual product. It has become, in our time period, um, forever linked and associated with vegetable shortening, something like Crisco. Uh, but the farther back you go, the word shortening was just used and it was any sort of fat that was hard at room temperature that caused the flour or the, the structure of the gluten to react a certain way. It shortened the gluten. Um, and butter, as much as some people would argue that butter sometimes isn't shortening. In this instance, butter is a shortening. Um, and so cooks weren't calling for something specific. They were just calling for a type of fat. And you would use whatever you had. And in this case, I'm gonna say that my family <laughs> had a cow and we had butter. And the last step before baking is to uh, Either flour your fingers and tamp them down. Oh, that works quite nicely. Or use a fork. Dip the fork in the flour and tamp them down or dip the fork in some water. I kind of like what my fingers are doing here. So I'm gonna stick with this because that's the first instruction in the book. Now the oven's preheated to 350 degrees. Standard cookie baking technique about 10 minutes. And while these are in the oven baking, I'm gonna put the rest of this dough on a tray the same way, except I'm gonna put them really close together. I'm gonna to stick that in the freezer and I can bake them some weeknight when Julie and I have a cookie emergency. Hey Glenn, hey, hey friends. Chris. Cookies, reading? Um, what a lovely afternoon. So I'm, I'm in the wild game section. It's this Ma's cooking. Okay, you're not, these aren't in the wild game No, section. no, okay, not. Okay, I was a little worried there. So there's, 
one, two, three, four things for raccoon, raccoons, raccoons possums. the possums, a couple of possums, groundhog, terrapin. What's the terrapin? I think it's, I think it's like a turtle. Hmm? I think it's like a turtle. And there's snapping turtle, there's fried turtle. And I laugh because in, when this was published in the 60s, um, a possum would never, no. never appear here. But we have them now in our yard we do all have the them time. Now. And the raccoons don't like the possums. I will say these are lovely. So these are, um, these are Maybell's molasses creams. But you didn't make them with, did they make them with molasses? No. no oh. Assuming since I see the sorghum. Mm -hmm. No, but they have that lovely, sweet, molasses-y, sorghum -y kind of flavor to them. Very light spice. Mm -hmm. Spice isn't, this, it's there. The sorghum comes through, but I think if you've never had sorghum and can't get sorghum, any molasses would do. These are quite nice. They're a little drier mm -hmm. than, than I would have thought, but that would make them so good for dunking in tea. Really good for dunking in tea. And that could also be you. Mm -hmm. You could have left them in a minute too long. Mm -hmm. Completely. Because mm -hmm. they're soft. They are. Mm -hmm. And they're crunchy on the edge. Mm -hmm. Sorry. They're really weird. They're really weird. And lovely. They are lovely. So. I'm going to take this little book. Mm -hmm. Boyd, I'm coming. No. <laughs> I'm going to take this little book next summer. And we're going to go to the family cabin in the Ozarks in Arkansas. Is that where it's? Oh, it is. It says right there. <laughs> We're gonna cook at least one in, and, the, in the old cabin. We're gonna we're gonna cook in the old cabin in the old family cabin in the Ozarks in Arkansas. It will be the darkest. Yeah. <laughs> light. I mean, it's an old cabin, right? An old, and, and we're gonna we're gonna choose something. I might not. We're gonna choose a recipe that you know isn't possum or raccoon or squirrel or groundhog. We're gonna choose a really good recipe. We're gonna go down there and we're gonna cook it, and we're gonna have a real. Ozark experience in the old cabin. I love that place. Yeah, I do too. I do too. <laughs> Some of the earliest motion picture of me is me and my cousin Bobby and I in, in diapers running around in front of the old cabin. So, um, yeah, we're coming. <laughs> Thanks okay. for stopping by. <laughs> see you again soon. I'm so glad I see you eating that cookie. I'm a little concerned. I only see like a dozen here. I feel like the recipe was a lot bigger. Mm. What are the rest of the cookies? Did you eat them all? No. No. <laughs> so. Two trays from oh, the cookies. Perfect. Yay. For later. Put these into an uh, airtight container now that they're frozen. And cook them from frozen. Yes, we've been experimenting with this with a lot of different recipes. Yeah, preheat your oven, 350 degrees. Cook them from frozen, start out at 10 minutes, just like it says in the recipe, and then you might extend it to 11 or 12. There's usually a few more minutes. It, they're not, they don't, um, if, they're, if they're round, they tend not to flatten out as yeah. much as your other cookies, but they're, you know. So same cooking, maybe a minute or two longer from frozen into the oven at 350. And so now we know that Glenn did not. I did not eat, eat all, all the cookies. cookies. No. I've kept, where are the rest where of them? Where are the rest of them? <laughs> <laughs>